So this video is a multiple choice review of functions and graphs. Let's start with the first problem. Consider the function f of x is equal to x squared minus 5x plus 7. Which of the following is equal to f of 3? So to evaluate the function, we simply need to replace x with 3. So it's going to be 3 squared minus 5 times 3 plus 7. 3 squared or 3 times 3, that's 9. 5 times 3 is 15. And 9 minus 15 is negative 6. Negative 6 plus 7 is equal to 1. So therefore, f of 3 is equal to 1. And that's the answer, which correlates to answer choice C. Number 2. If f of x equals 10, which of the following could be a value of x? By the way, I recommend pausing the video and working out the problem yourself. If you do so, you're going to get a lot more out of this lesson. Now, since f of x is equal to 10, we can replace f of x with 10. Our goal in this problem is to solve for the value of x. So let's begin by adding 8 to both sides. Negative 8 plus 8 is 0, which is nothing. 10 plus 8 is 18. So now we need to divide both sides by 2. 2 divided by 2 is 1. 18 divided by 2 is 9. So 9 is equal to the absolute value of x minus 5. Now, to get rid of the absolute value symbol, we need to write two equations. 9 is equal to x minus 5, and negative 9 is equal to x minus 5. So we're going to get two possible answers. First, let's add 5 to both sides. 9 plus 5 is 14. And then let's do the same to the other side or the other equation. Negative 9 plus 5 is negative 4. So we have two possible values for x. x can equal 14 or it can equal negative 4. However, negative 4 is the only one listed, so therefore b is the right answer. Number 3. Which of the following is a function? Is it a, b, c, or d? Now, for a graph to represent a function, it has to pass the vertical line test. So let's look at answer choice A. If we draw a vertical line, notice that it touches it at two points. Therefore, A does not represent a function. Looking at answer choice C, it touches the vertical line at three points. So it does not pass the vertical line test. So C is not a function. For a curve to pass the vertical line test, it must touch the vertical line only at one point. So for answer choice D, it touches the vertical line at two points, so D does not represent a function. But for B, it only touches it at one point. So answer choice B is a function. Number four, what is the value of F of negative one according to the graph shown below? So how can we determine the value of F of negative one? Now, it's important to understand that when you're dealing with functions, x is the number inside the function, and the entire function is equal to y. So we're looking for the value of y when x is equal to negative 1. x is equal to negative 1 at this point. So we need to find a curve, and we can see that y is equal to 2. So when x is negative 1, y is 2. So we have the point negative 1, comma 2. So this is the answer we're looking for. f of negative 1 is equal to 2, which means that d is the right answer choice. Number 5. If f of x is equal to 3, which of the following could be a value of x? Recall that we said that f of x is equal to y. So if f of x is equal to 3, then we can clearly see that y is equal to 3. So when y is 3, what is the value of x? So y is 3 at this point. So if we draw a line, y equals 3 at this point and at this point. So now let's locate the x values. So x can be negative 2, or it can be some other number which is probably approximately about 5. So 5 is not listed as one of the answer choices, but negative 2 is. So x can be negative 2. 
Number six, what are the intervals where f of x is increasing, decreasing, and constant? So let's talk about when it's increasing. It's increasing in this section, and it's also increasing in this section. So one point of interest is negative two, and it's always increasing before that, so that's negative infinity, and it begins to increase again when x is three, and since we have an arrow, it continues to increase all the way to positive infinity. So in writing intervals, you're dealing with the x values, not the y values. So the intervals where the function is increasing is negative infinity to negative two. That's the first part. And then to connect it with the second part, we need to use the union symbol. So union three to infinity. Now what about when the function is decreasing? It's decreasing here and here. That's when the values of y is going down. So that's from negative two to negative one and from two to three. It's decreasing as well. So I'm going to write negative two comma negative one union two to three. And then finally, when is it constant? It's constant in this region. That is from negative one to two. And so that's it. So we have the intervals where the function is increasing, decreasing, and constant. Number seven, identify the location of the relative maximum of f of x. So the maximum, the relative maximum, looks like a mountain or a hill. The relative minimum looks like a valley. So this is the relative maximum that we're looking for. And the x value is associated with the location of the relative extrema. So it's located at x equals negative 2. So therefore, b is the right answer. Number 8. What is the relative minimum value of f of x? The relative minimum is located right here. Now, from the last problem, we saw that the location of the extreme value, or the relative extreme value, is associated with the x-coordinate. The y-coordinate is associated with the value itself, not the location. So the value of the relative minimum is negative 2. That's the y-coordinate of this point. And so therefore, b is the right answer. Number 9. What is the value of f of 4? So we have a piecewise function. And which part of the piecewise function should we use? Is it x squared plus 4 or 7x minus 6? Now, 4 is greater than 2. It's not less than a negative 3. So therefore, we need to use the first one. So it's going to be 4 squared plus 4. 4 squared is 16. 16 plus 4 is 20. So f of 4 is equal to 20, which means that d is the correct answer choice. Number 10. What is the domain and range of the graph shown below? So let's start with the domain. The domain represents the x values. And let's express it using interval notation. So the lowest x value is negative 5. And then the highest x value for this portion of the graph is negative 2. Then it starts up again at positive 2. And then this arrow tells us that it goes to infinity. Now, we have a closed circle. So we need to include negative 5. So the domain is going to be negative 5 to negative 2. Now, because we have an open circle at negative 2, we need to use a parenthesis to show that negative 2 is not included. So x doesn't equal negative 2, but it's less than negative 2. And then union, 2 to infinity. Always use a parenthesis symbol for infinity. Now, if you want to write this using inequalities, you could say that x is less than negative 2, but equal to or greater than negative 5. That covers this part. You could also say that x is greater than or equal to 2. So we can use an OR statement. 
Now what about the range? The lowest y value that we see, the range is associated with the y values, the lowest one is at negative 5. And then the highest one for the first part of the graph is negative 3. Then it starts up at 1, and then the arrow tells us that it goes up all the way to positive infinity. So to write the range in interval notation, we're going to start with the lowest y value of negative 5. And we have a closed circle, so it includes negative 5. And then it stops at negative 3. And then we need to connect the first part with the second part. So we're going to use the union symbol. It's going to start back up at 1 and go all the way to infinity. So as an inequality, we can say that y is less than negative 3, but equal to or greater than negative 5. We could also say that y is equal to or greater than 1. So now you know how to write the domain and range using inequalities and interval notation. So that's it for this problem. Number 11. Find the difference quotient of the function shown below. So here's the formula that will help you to determine the difference quotient. It's f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. So what is f of x plus h? To determine f of x plus h, simply replace x with x plus h. So f of x plus h is going to be the square root of x plus h plus 2. And f of x itself is just the square root of x plus 2. So how can we simplify this expression? So what we need to do is multiply the fraction by the conjugate of the numerator. So the conjugate is going to be the square root of x plus h plus 2. But instead of minus, it's going to have the opposite sign, plus, and then square root x plus 2. Now, whatever you do to the top of a fraction, you must also do to the bottom of a fraction so that the value of the fraction stays the same. So now we need to FOIL. The square root of x plus h plus 2 times itself, the square roots will cancel, and it will give us the stuff on the inside, x plus h plus 2. Now, if we multiply these two terms, that's going to give us plus square root x plus h plus 2 times the square root of x plus 2. And then if we multiply these two terms, we're going to get the same thing, but positive. And this one should have been negative, so let me just change that. Due to this negative sign. And then if we multiply the square root of x plus 2 times the square root of x plus 2 with the negative sign, that's going to be negative x plus 2. And so this is all divided by h times that stuff. Now let's see what we can cancel. So these two terms will cancel. They add up to 0. And so what we have left over is going to be x plus h plus 2. And then we need to distribute the negative sign. So that's going to be negative 8x, excuse me, negative x minus 2. And on the bottom, it's going to be h times the square root of x plus h plus 2 plus this. So now we can cancel the 2s. 2 plus negative 2 is 0. And we can cancel x. So we're left with h divided by h times the same stuff. So now h divided by h is 1. So the final answer for this problem, the difference quotient, it's equal to 1 divided by the square root of x plus h plus 2 plus the square root of x plus 2. So this is the final answer.